Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. My name is Bill Rutledge, and I'm the Dean of the University of Georgia Law School, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the 114th Sibley Lecture to be delivered today by United States Court of Appeals Judge Richard Tallman. In 1964, the Lordians Foundation of Atlanta created this lecture in honor of the late John A. Sibley, a 1911 graduate of the law school that honors his leadership, his public contributions to the University of Georgia and to the state over nearly 80 years. In the more than 50 years since this lecture was first created, some of the nation's most influential legal scholars and judges have contributed to it. The very first lecture took place in 1964 on the topic of jurisprudence in a free society. And since then, some of the orators of this lecture have included Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, Supreme Court Justice and then at that time Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as well as several judges on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, including John Noonan and James Browning. In following in that tradition of great jurists who have delivered the Sibley Lecture is today's speaker, the Honorable Richard Tallman. Appointed to the United States Court of Appeals by President Bill Clinton and confirmed by the United States Senate, he has sat on the federal courts for over 15 years. In 2014, his judicial responsibilities expanded when then, still now, Chief Justice John Roberts appointed him to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review, which is responsible for hearing appeals of decisions regarding government actions seeking orders, of, in, orders in aid of espionage and counterterrorism investigations. In addition to his service to the country, while this is Judge Tallman's first visit to Athens, this is not his first connection to the University of Georgia. And it's my privilege to acknowledge the presence of our fellow alum and former student, Amanda McDowell, who currently serves as a law clerk for Judge Tallman, reflecting the fact that this opportunity to serve in the early stages of your legal career is not only something of great formative value to a young lawyer, a great opportunity to public service, but a personal priority for me at the law school. And Amanda, I'd like to welcome you back home. And with that, I hope you'll join me in welcoming the 114th Sibley Lecture of the Honorable Richard Tallman. Sure. Dean Rutledge, uh, thank you. I am humbled and honored uh, to be here this afternoon. And before I begin, I do want to thank Amanda for her help in writing the speech. That is other duties as required of a, a law clerk uh, in my chambers. Ladies and gentlemen, from the earliest days of the Republic, we have frequently been reminded that eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. And for all Americans, September the 11th, 2001, will always be an unforgettable memory. It has now been 16 years since our country was changed forever, when nearly 3,000 lives were taken after agents of Al-Qaeda, a terrorist organization, hijacked commercial airplanes, and attacked the World Trade Center and the Department of Defense. A third plane crashed in a Pennsylvania field, sparing God knows how many additional lives at the cost of all souls aboard United Flight 93. Our nation has been at war ever since. The war on terror has impacted millions of Americans, servicemen and women, their families, and has shaken the very foundation of our system of justice. Responding to an enemy difficult to identify and to engage 
has produced fundamental challenges to basic principles of law and morality. Some of the weapons and tactics employed in our defense have caused many to wonder whether in our efforts to prevail against international terrorism, we have been forced to compromise fundamental principles enshrined in the Constitution. The bulwark of our freedom and the supreme law of the land since the founding of the Republic. Several significant issues have arisen in recent years as a result of the detention of suspected terrorists captured abroad. These include the conditions of detention, the methods of interrogation, and the issue that I'm going to speak to you about today, where and how these detainees should be brought to justice. Whenever someone is captured during military hostilities, a series of questions come into play. Are we at war? What is the legal status of this person? Is he or she a prisoner of war, an unlawful combatant, an enemy combatant, a criminal conspirator, an aider and a better, or something else? Is the person a citizen or lawful permanent resident of, of our country? or an alien? Where is the person in military custody being held? What type of sovereignty exists over the location of the detention? The answers are important because they trigger legal rights that have historically been afforded certain types of detainees. Then, if a detainee will not be released or is to be indefinitely detained, for the duration of hostilities, where and how will he or she be prosecuted? There are several options, including trial by general court-martial, before a military commission or a special tribunal, or in civilian or international criminal courts. And each comes with a set of procedures and legal rights that are unique to that forum. Since the 9-11 attacks, the three branches of government have struggled to answer these questions for those detained in the ongoing war on terror. Prior to the war in Vietnam, the law of war was fairly easy to understand. Combatants wore uniforms, unless they were spies or saboteurs, and when captured on the field of battle, they were entitled to the protection of the Geneva Conventions. Now, the conventions are a series of four treaties, the first of which was signed in the 1920s, and the last of which was signed after World War II. But not every country in the world is a signatory to the Geneva Conventions, and they certainly have not been signed by terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Following the surrender of Nazi Germany, an international tribunal was convened at Nuremberg, to try former high-ranking party officials and German military officers on charges of crimes against humanity or acts against the law of war. The judgments at Nuremberg were generally recognized as appropriate by the international legal community, or at least among the allies and the neutrals of World War II. It was easy to identify the defendants because they had held formal public offices or commissions in the German military. The stage is not so simple now. Although we typically say that the war on terrorism began with the attacks of September 11, 2001 on our soil, America has been at war with terrorists since at least 1983, when 241 United States Marines were killed in their barracks in Lebanon. That was followed by the deaths of 19 at the Kobar Towers in Dharan, Saudi Arabia. Then 224 were lost in attacks on our embassies in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi in East Africa. And 17 were killed in a maritime attack on a guided missile destroyer, the USS Cole, docked in Yemen. On September 11, 2001, the enemy brought the battle to our homeland. 
2,749 were killed at the World Trade Center's Twin Towers in New York City. Another 184 at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And 40 died in a Pennsylvania field resisting the skyjacking of one of the commercial airliners intended for another high-profile target in the nation's capital. This evolving threat of terrorism challenges our constitutional system of checks and balances. As you all know, the United States Constitution divides power between three co-equal but independent branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And the Constitution separates the power to declare and prosecute war as part of its system of checks and balances. It declares that Congress shall have the power, quote, to declare war and make rules concerning captures on land and water, end quote. But it designates the president as commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. Finally, as Justice Anthony Kennedy concluded in a case that we'll talk about later today, within the Constitution's separation of powers structures, few exercises of judicial power are as legitimate or as necessary as the responsibility to hear challenges to the authority of the executive to imprison a person. Congress responded to the September 11 tax attacks by passing a joint resolution authorizing the president to, quote, use all necessary and appropriate force against the nations, organizations, or persons he determined planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or powers, end quote. Acting under this authorization for use of military force and having determined that the Taliban regime had supported al-Qaeda, the president ordered the invasion of Afghanistan. Hundreds of individual, uh, individuals were captured in the ensuing hostilities and eventually brought for detention to the United States naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. At one time, nearly 800 detainees were held at Guantanamo. In the context of the prosecution of the Guantanamo Bay detainees arrested all over the world, and in including the 9-11 conspiracy suspects, each branch has used its unique powers to shape the debate over how, when, and where justice will be administered to the alleged terrorists. I will begin with President George W. Bush's decision in 2001 to prosecute by military commission suspected terrorists captured abroad. I will then talk about the initial petitions filed in federal court by Guant Guantanamo detainees seeking relief from their detention, which led to the Supreme Court's decision that the military tribunals convened by President Bush were unconstitutional because Congress had not authorized the president to establish them. From there, I will discuss how Congress responded, passing the Military Commissions Act, which explicitly authorized the executive to prosecute detainees by military tribunals. I will then talk about former Attorney General Eric Holder's decision to prosecute the 9-11 suspects in federal court in Manhattan and how Congress effectively thwarted that decision through the power of the purse. Finally, I will comment on the capability of the federal courts to oversee the prosecution of high-profile suspected terrorists like the 9-11 suspects. We begin shortly after 9-11. President Bush made the decision that detainees captured as part of the War on Terror would not be treated as prisoners of war. In support of that decision, he said, quote, the war against terrorism ushers in a new paradigm, one in which groups with broad international reach commit horrific acts 
against innocent civilians, sometimes with direct support of states. Our nation recognizes that this new paradigm, ushered in not by us, but by terrorists, requires new thinking in the law of war." End quote. After making that statement, he issued an executive order authorizing the creation of military tribunals for the trial of certain non-citizens suspected of ties to Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations who have conspired and carried out attacks against us here and abroad. The order stated that the detainees tried by military tribunal would not be allowed to seek any remedy in federal court. Now, a military tribunal is different from federal court. In federal court, as you know, the judge is appointed for life. The defendant can only be convicted by a unanimous jury of his peers, and he's entitled to confront the witnesses and the evidence against him. By contrast, before a military commission, Military officers serve as both judge and jury, and accept under limited circumstances, the decision to convict does not need to be unanimous. Military tribunals also have much more generous rules favoring the government regarding the admission of evidence, such as permitting hearsay from someone who is not in court and who is not available for cross-examination and the rules make it easier to seal confidential records and to exclude the accused from sensitive parts of the proceeding so as not to reveal state secrets or military plans or capabilities. In general, prior to the issuance of the executive order, people captured during a conflict were prosecuted by courts martial. A court martial is a military court used to try members of our own armed forces as well as prisoners of war. Under the Geneva Conventions, POWs must be tried by the same procedures as those used against the custodial branch's service members. In each branch of the U.S. Armed Services, courts martial are convened under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, established by Congress in reliance on its constitutional authority found in Article I, Section 8, quote, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces and to define and punish offenses against the law of nations, end quote. There is some precedent for the detrial of detainees who were not classified as POWs by military tribunal. And what I'm about to summarize now is basically a history of military tribunals that was quoted extensively in the Supreme Court's opinion in Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, and it in turn relies on a Harvard Law Review article by Bradley and Goldsmith called Congressional Authorization in the War on Terrorism. Historically, military tribunals have been used under three circumstances. First, at times and in places where martial law has been declared. For example, during the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus and tried by military commission approximately 4,000 rebels uh, arrested within the United States. The territory of Hawaii was governed under martial law for three years after Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7, 1941. But after the war, in 1946, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional Hawaiian martial law commissions that had tried civilians for criminal acts in the islands. The court said there was no reason to supplant the civilian courts already located there, which could easily have reopened following December 7 to resume handling local cases for what was then the territory of Hawaii. Second, military tribunals have been used to try civilians in occupied territory when the civilian government was not able to function. For example, during the occupation of Germany after World War II, a commission was established to administer the German criminal code. Finally, tribunals have been convened as incident to the conduct of war when there is a need to seize and subject to disciplinary measures uh, 
those enemies who in their attempt to thwart or impede our military effort have violated the law of war. In Ex parte Quirin in 1942, the Supreme Court authorized the use of such a tribunal. During World War II, eight German soldiers dressed as civilians landed on Long Island, New York, and in Florida, intending to sabotage U.S. defense industries. Two of the German soldiers defected, and the would-be saboteurs were apprehended. President Franklin D. Roosevelt authorized the use of military tribunals, and within a month, all eight were convicted. Six were sentenced to death by electrocution, the Supreme Court denied the defendants' challenge to their convictions, finding the tribunals uh, had been expressly sanctioned by Congress to try offenders of the law of war. The sentences were carried out. Until 2001, the United States had not convened a military tribunal since World War II. Because the Guantanamo Bay detainees were not classified as prisoners of war. They were instead to be considered enemy combatants, defined as, quote, an individual who was part of or supporting Taliban or Al Qaeda forces or associated forces that are engaged in hostilities against the United States or its coalition partners, end quote. And that determination is made by a combatant status review tribunal convened by executive order issued on July 7, 2004. The decision was not unprecedented. The International Military Tribunals convened at Nuremberg had designated various components of four Nazi groups, the Leadership Corps, Gestapo, SD, and SS as criminal organizations. Knowing and voluntary participation in such an organization constituted the crime of membership and was punished by death. The decision by the executive to prosecute enemy combatants from the war on terror before military tribunals stirred up considerable controversy, which landed in the lap of federal courts. In particular, several detainees filed petitions in federal court seeking writs of habeas corpus. And as all law students know, habeas corpus, or the great writ, is the legal procedure that keeps the government from holding a person indefinitely without showing cause to do so. Essentially, an application is made before a judge, and a petitioner claims that he is being held in violation of the Constitution, and if satisfied that a proper showing has been made, a judge may issue the writ commanding the executive to release the individual from his custody. Its origins date back to the Magna Carta in 1215, which decreed that no man would be imprisoned contrary to the law of the land. English courts gradually recognized the writ of habeas corpus by which the law courts could enforce the king's prerogative to inquire into the authority of a jailer to hold the prisoner. For it is said that the king is entitled at all times to have an account why the liberty of any of his subjects is restrained. The US Constitution specifically protects this habeas procedure in what is known as the Suspension Clause, Article 1, Section 9, which states, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. Seeking issuance of the writ of habeas corpus has been the primary legal mechanism employed by Guantanamo Bay detainees to challenge their detention in federal court. Both the President and Congress have attempted to prevent the detainees from using the writ, but with limited success in the Supreme Court. On June 28, 2004, three years after the executive order established military tribunals, the Supreme Court held in Rasul versus Bush that foreign nationals captured abroad and held at Guantanamo Bay 
could challenge their detention in federal court. The court sent the case back to the district court, leaving unresolved what further proceedings would be necessary to address the merits of the detainee claims. Meanwhile, the trial of Selene Ahmad Hamdan, who was allegedly Osama bin Laden's bodyguard and chauffeur, was underway before a military tribunal. In the midst of those proceedings, Mr. Hamdan filed a habeas petition in federal court. And on November 8, 2004, District of Columbia District Judge James Robertson ordered the Pentagon to stop the trial because the military tribunals in their current form were unconstitutional. That decision itself was remarkable in finding, among other things, that President George W. Bush did not have the authority to decide that detainees were not entitled to the protection of the Geneva Conventions, and secondly, that the military tribunals authorized by the President did not afford sufficient constitutional due process protection to the accused. But perhaps what is more remarkable, in compliance with Judge Robertson's decision, which marked the first time that a United States court had ever intervened to stop an ongoing military proceeding, the executive branch halted Mr. Hamdan's trial. It's important to note that the judiciary has no means of enforcing its judgments. The courts have no army. The judiciary budget is set by Congress and generally covers only that which is necessary to pay the, to pay the cost of the administration of the courts. The entire budget of the U.S. judiciary is less than one half of one percent of the federal budget. In other words, the federal courts are at the mercy of the executive to enforce their judgments and at the sufferance of Congress to provide needed funds. This division of power is critical to our system of governance. Thus, as judges, it is not enough that we reach a decision. We must also explain our reasoning so that the people and their elected officials respect and abide by these decisions, even when they do not agree with the end results. The treatment of, of uh, post 9-11 detainees has repeatedly tested the willingness of the political branches to respect the decisions of the Supreme Court on politically charged and divisive issues. But let's return to Mr. Hamdan, bin Laden's driver, whose trial by military commission was halted following Judge Robertson's decision. The government appealed. The United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reversed, and the Supreme Court granted certiorari to hear the case. <coughs> However, before the Supreme Court could issue its decision, Congress decided to weigh in, passing the Detainee Treatment Act, which provided that detainees could seek limited review of their detention in the DC Circuit, but otherwise did not have the right to access any other federal courts. Now remember that unlike the Supreme Court, Article I, Section 3 of the Constitution provides that there shall be one Supreme Court and such other inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So Congress exercised that power and restricted the right of all courts except the DC Circuit to hear these cases. On June 29, 2006, the Supreme Court ruled five to three. They were missing Chief Justice Roberts because he had previously heard the issue as a member of the three judge panel of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So the court ruled five to three that the military commission as it existed by presidential executive order was unconstitutional and could not proceed. In reaching that decision, Justice Stevens, writing for the majority, explained that looking closely at the language of the Detainee Treatment Act, it was not intended to apply to pending habeas petitioners like Mr. Hamdan because his, pay, his case was active and pending at the time the act was passed. Thus, the court left for another day the question whether Guantanamo detainees had a constitutional right to seek habeas relief. And that day eventually arrived two years later in 2008 
when the court decided Bumijin versus Bush. More on that later. In Hamdan, the court went on to consider the military tribunals established by executive order and found that the president lacked the authority to establish them because Congress had not authorized him to do so. The tribunals lacked the power to proceed because they did not afford the same rights to the accused as a courts martial. For example, the detainee and his civilian attorney could be prevented from ever seeing the evidence used against him. Their structure and procedures were found to have violated both the Uniform Code of Military Justice and the Geneva Conventions. Of particular interest is a separate concurring opinion authored by Justice Breyer and joined by Justices Kennedy, Souter, and Ginsburg. Justice Breyer explained, quote, the court's conclusion ultimately rests upon a single ground. Congress has not issued the executive a blank check. Indeed, Congress has denied the president the legislative authority to create military commissions of the kind at issue here. But nothing prevents the president from returning to Congress to seek the authority he believes necessary." End quote. So Congress followed Justice Breyer's suggestion just a few months later, passing the Military Commission Act of 2006, or the MCA. The MCA authorizes the executive to prosecute detainees by military tribunals. It also provides for limited judicial review by the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, but explicitly prohibits other federal courts from considering habeas petitions brought by detainees. And this time, Congress made clear that the prohibition on habeas relief applied to cases pending at the time the MCA was enacted. The executive renewed its prosecution of detainees by military tribunals as provided for by the MCA. Among those prosecuted were the five detainees believed to have planned the September 11th attacks. You may remember the photograph of the alleged mastermind, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in his white undershirt, which was splashed across the front pages of every major newspaper around the time of his capture. On June 5, 2008, the five 9-11 suspects were arraigned in front of a military judge and the case proceeded toward trial. During this time, the Guantanamo detainees had filed a number of petitions challenging the MCA's provision preventing detainees from seeking habeas relief in other courts. One of the petitions, Bumijin versus Bush, eventually made it to the Supreme Court. Bumijin challenged the process used to determine that he was an enemy combatant. The MCA allowed for only limited judicial review of that, of that initial administrative determination. In June 2008, one week after the arraignment of the 9-11 detainees, the Supreme Court ruled five to four that the enemy combatants held at Guantanamo Bay were entitled to the privilege of habeas corpus to challenge their decision based on that classification. The court held that the suspension clause applied to the detainees at Guantanamo, some of whom had been held for up to six years without charges of any kind or hearing to challenge their detention. The MCA did not purport to be a formal suspension of the writ as required by the suspension clause, and the MCA did not provide an equivalent substitute to habeas relief. Thus, the court found that the detainees could continue to seek writs of habeas corpus in the federal courts, which must, under our Constitution, quote, have sufficient authority to conduct a meaningful review of both the cause for detention and the executive's power to detain, end quote. The court, however, declined to detail the procedural or substantive contours of this habeas review and left, and I just love this, quote, to the expertise and competence of the district court, end quote, to fashion the rules that should govern the detainee's claim. 
It's sort of akin to further proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion, uh, which I hate. Uh, as I will discuss <laughs> shortly, the aftermath of the Boo Majin decision has resulted in the development of a remarkably interesting body of case law in the lower federal courts, particularly in the D.C. Circuit. The Supreme Court in Boo was particularly concerned that if a detainee was mistakenly designated as an enemy combatant, the consequence of error may be detention for the duration of hostilities that may last a generation or more, a risk, the court said, too significant to ignore. Justice Scalia, dissenting in Boo Majin, cited the fact that at least 13 detainees previously voluntarily released from Guantanamo have returned to the battlefield. Some were captured again or killed, but others succeeded in carrying on their atrocities against both innocent civilians and our military. He concluded, the nation will live to regret what the court has done today. That number has since risen to 118, and the source of that figure is a paper issued recently by the uh, administration entitled The Reengagement of Detainees Formerly Held at Guantanamo Bay. Unlike federal, or unlike federal judges like myself who are appointed to hold office for life during good behavior, members of the executive and legislative branches are elected to fix terms of office. As a result, President Bush pressed to try the 9-11 suspects by military tribunal before he left office. But, as sometimes happens, a, personal, uh, a personnel decision uh, prevented this effort. The chief military judge at Guantanamo announced his retirement, leaving the position temporarily vacant, and President Obama was sworn into office before the trials began. In May 2009, President Obama announced that he would revamp, but not wholly reject, the system of military tribunals established by the Military Commissions Act. President Obama got what he asked for when Congress passed the Military Commissions Act of 2009, an amended version of the 2006 MCA legislation, in an effort to respond to the concerns raised by the Supreme Court in Boo Majin. Throughout his time in office, President Obama has spoken openly about his opposition to the continuing detentions at Guantanamo Bay. During the current administration, 147 detainees have been transferred out of Guantanamo. 81 have been transferred to countries in the Middle East, Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. 47 have been transferred to countries in Europe and Asia. 13 have been transferred to the Americas. And six have been transferred to their home countries. And those statistics come uh, from a February 2016 plan uh, released by the president and captioned the plan for closing the Guantanamo Bay detention facility. In February 2016, President Obama announced his plan for closing Guantanamo and outlined his plans for the future of military commissions. The president stressed his desire to work with Congress to make legislative changes that would allow detainees to plead guilty in Article III courts and to establish a site for ongoing military commission proceedings inside the United States. But even the February 2016 administration plan acknowledges that there will remain a small number of detainees who cannot be transferred to secure facilities in other countries or prosecuted in military or civilian courts and who will have to be held, quote, at an appropriate site, end quote, in the continental United States while the administration works with Congress, quote, to identify other appropriate and lawful dispositions, end quote. The risk, of course, remains that those transferred to other countries will continue to engage in hostilities or terrorist activities. The ongoing detention of suspected terrorists at Guantanamo Bay has raised difficult questions about where, how, and when these detainees should be prosecuted. Under the 2009 Military Commission Acts, certain detainees have continued to be prosecuted by military commission. 
At the same time, habeas corpus petitions filed by many of the detainees challenging the revised MCA are being heard in federal courts. In November 2009, General Holder announced that the five 9-11 detainees would be transferred to New York and tried in the United States District Court for the Southern District. The charges that had been filed before a military tribunal during the Bush administration were dropped and indictments were filed in the Southern District of New York. Not surprisingly, a heated debate ensued. Elected officials debated whether the federal court system was appropriate to try the five 9-11 detainees and whether the detainees were entitled to the constitutional guarantees of an Article III court. You all know that the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg initially announced his support stating, quote, it is fitting that 9-11 suspects face justice near the Trade Center site where so many New Yorkers were murdered, end quote. Later, he withdrew his support, estimating that the city would have to spend over $200 million per year on additional security for the trial. Some expressed fear that Attorney General Holder's decision would invite another terrorist attack on New York. Others worried about the release of highly confidential information which could harm our counterterrorism efforts and put federal agents, members of the military, and confidential informants at risk. When Attorney General Holder held firm on his decision to commence federal court trials in Manhattan, Congress took action. Although the decision whether and when to prosecute detainees is made by the executive, Congress has the power of the purse and Congress decided to use it. At the end of 2010, it withdrew funding to pay for the transfer of Guantanamo Bay detainees to the United States. Because in federal court, a criminal defendant has a constitutional right to be present at trial, the congressional move made it impossible to try the detainees anywhere outside of Guantanamo. There was now no budgetary authority to fund the United States Marshal's costs to bring them to New York. In April 2011, Attorney General Holder reversed himself and announced that the 9-11 suspects would now be tried by military commission at Guantanamo. The charges in federal court were dismissed in Manhattan and the prosecution by military tribunal began anew. The five detainees named as alleged conspirators in the September 11, 2011 terror attacks were arraigned on May 5 of 2012 at the Camp Justice War Compound at the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This brings us to the present time. No trial date has been set for the 9-11 suspects, and pretrial hearings continue to drag on before the military commissions. The Pentagon has built a $12 million courtroom capable of trying six alleged co-conspirators before one judge and a jury. Media and other observers are to be sequestered in a soundproof room behind thick glass and hear the court audio feed on a slight delay. The judge and court information security officers have mute buttons to silence the feed to the observer's booth if they suspect that someone in the court has or is about to reveal classified information. Cases still pending under the Military Commissions Act will require significant time and money as lawyers identify, produce, and examine an enormous volume of classified material. Hundreds of motions have already been filed, frequently raising matters of first impression. It is predicted that trials and appeals will go on for years. Thought is also being given to new legislation to permit detainees who wish to do so to plead guilty in Article III courts and to be sentenced outside of the military commission so they can serve their sentences in federal prisons under our criminal laws. At the same time, the federal courts continue to receive habeas corpus petitions from the detainees. As I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court in Bu Majin left it to the lower federal courts to sort out how the judicial process in Guantanamo 
detainee habeas proceedings will work. Lower federal courts, and in particular the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, are currently addressing a wide array of difficult questions. Who bears the burden of proof in these cases? And what is the burden? What are the boundaries of the president's detention power? What sort of evidence can the government rely upon? How should courts handle hearsay and evidence that may have been given involuntarily? Can a detainee challenge the conditions of his confinement? What types of offenses can be adjudicated by military commissions? Another interesting question to me, as a circuit judge on a court that hears half of the nation's immigration appeals, is the extent to which those laws might apply to alien detainees transferred to U.S. soil. Should they then be able to apply for relief under the Immigration and Naturalization Act? Historically, we have said our immigration laws don't apply to persons captured under the laws of war who are brought to the United States. But there are gaps in the INA that don't, don't contemplate a Guantanamo detainee who reaches our soil and asks for the right to remain here. An alien who can be proven to have engaged in terrorist activity is normally statutorily ineligible for, uh, for asylum. But he might be able to apply for withholding of removal if he can show a reasonable probability that removing him to a designated country would result in persecution on a protected ground under the Refugee Act. Or he might invoke the protection of the Convention Against Torture if he can show a reasonable likelihood that he will be tortured after removal to somewhere else. Finally, what do we do about future captures? None of these questions have clear answers emanating from either Congress or the Supreme Court. And these questions and many more are currently facing the lower federal courts. The Supreme Court has not granted review of a Guantanamo detention case since Boumediene, and the D.C. Circuit Court has become the court of last resort for many of the foreign nationals remaining at Guantanamo Bay. My final thoughts that I want to share before opening this up for questions and comments is whether the federal courts would be equipped to handle the prosecution of the 9-11 suspects. Concerns about releasing highly confidential information at trial are real and should not be underestimated. In federal court, unlike military tribunals, there is a presumption that the proceedings will be public and that the accused has a right to see, to be present at all material stages of the proceedings, to see all the evidence against him, and to confront and cross-examine his accusers. However, judges are regularly asked to seal records or limit evidence to be revealed in the courtroom and thus have experience in handling these types of issues. But information valuable to our enemies will inevitably come out in a public trial in open court. But it is also worth remembering that earlier terrorists responsible for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing were successfully prosecuted in federal court in Manhattan. Those men were tried, convicted by a jury, and sentenced to what amounted to life sentences. Their convictions were upheld on appeal, and the men are now incarcerated in federal correctional facilities around the country. Security during the World Trade Center trial was tight, but there were no major incidents. In fact, the courthouse in Manhattan already has a tunnel deep underground, which is used to transfer highly dangerous defendants between the detention center and the courthouse. U.S. District Judge Kevin Duffy, who presided over that trial and who is an exceptional trial judge, and his wife were kept under 24-hour protection by the United States Marshals Service for over a decade because of death threats posted on terrorist websites. But it can be done. The legality of current military commissions and the type of process they must afford to detainees remain open questions. The resolution of these questions calls for a delicate balancing between designing procedures to ensure justice for detainees while at the same time successfully prosecuting the war most effectively. And in setting the rules, we must be mindful of the need to preserve our intelligence and military secrets. 
while finding out as much as we can about terrorist activities planned for the future so that we can prevent them from occurring. It is the role of the judiciary to hold that delicate balance steady and true. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? It's kind of a sobering topic. Yeah. I have to confess I have not read Amr, so I'm afraid I, I can't give you my thoughts on that case. I, you know, I can say generally that it seems clear to me now, based on the Supreme Court precedent, that detainees do have a right, at least in the D.C. Circuit, to file habeas petitions. Uh, I am also aware of the fact that there have been some decisions that have said you can't complain about the manner in which you're being kept and that federal courts don't have cognizance over that kind of an issue. I find that somewhat interesting given the fact that we regularly, at least in the Ninth Circuit, and I'm sure this is true all over the country, um, get either 1983 or habeas corpus challenges all the time to conditions of confinement. You know, somebody gets, a gang member gets classified uh, in the California prison system and gets put permanently in what they call administrative segregation, which is essentially solitary confinement. And, and we hear those cases. So I, um, I have to say I find that curious. Yeah? Uh, so to what extent of your speech, you talked about delicate balance. Are, are you familiar with the provisions of the USA Freedom Act that was passed in June uh, of last year? Okay, uh, you should read it. Um, it has significantly changed the structure of, uh, of those courts. Uh, we now have appointed and cleared with the appropriate security clearances a half a dozen uh, private lawyers who we are to appoint in any case in which the uh, first level of the FISA court certifies that the question involves a matter of first impression or a case uh, of national significance. We then appoint the amici to give us the countervailing side to the government's arguments. And to the extent that we can redact our opinions, uh, they will be uh, posted on, on a publicly available site um, so that hopefully the public can understand a little bit more about what we do. But I do also want to point out that the FISA court operates quite differently from an Article III trial court in this sense. It's sort of a cross between federal grand jury proceedings and presentations ex parte by the government under Title III, for example, where the government is seeking a wiretap application. Um, and for the same reasons that we would not want the subjects of the investigation to know that we're on to them, there are very good reasons why those proceedings need to be kept secret. And of course, the biggest problem when you're doing either uh, foreign espionage or counterterrorism counter cases is you don't want the enemy to know what we know and how we know it. Um, and it, it is a very delicate balance. Congress, uh, if you look at some of the legislative history that surrounded the June legislation, Congress had a very difficult time trying to figure out where to draw the line in order to meet the legitimate concerns about protecting privacy at the same time protecting our national security. Yeah? Um, you mentioned the Freedom Act. Didn't you? <laughs> I cannot comment on, on that particular case because of the fact that uh, Mr. Snowden is currently a wanted uh, individual as far as the United States is concerned, and there may come a day when uh, we have to hear uh, something in regard to, to Mr. Snowden. So, uh, sure. <laughs> I'll give you one more free one. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Let's see, anybody else? Yeah, in the back. Uh, Professor? I'm sure that uh, these were very important public I do, and, and, I, and I have to say, I have never been more proud of the private bar than when I see them appear before me on a pro bono matter that cries out for good legal representation, and it's being rendered on behalf of someone who could never afford that lawyer's hourly rates. And as you mentioned, uh, many of the cases that I talked about that made their way to the Supreme Court benefited from who knows how many hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in donated time by some of the best law firms and the best lawyers in the country. Uh, 
that recognize the significance of the legal issues that were being presented and the need to get them adequately briefed and teed up for the Supreme Court. And I want to encourage all of you when you get out into practice to be sure and give back to your communities through pro bono efforts, um, engagements in, in these kinds of cases. And, and you know, not only the, the big earth-shaking cases like, uh, like these cases, but for example, in my court, uh, we have lots of, uh, half of our 14,000 case docket is pro se. And uh, many of the claims, I don't know what the percentage is, but many of the cases present significant issues either in civil rights, immigration, uh, that would really benefit from pro bono representation. And we have a special program in which we will guarantee that if lawyers will agree to take pro bono assignments from the court, that we will guarantee opportunities for young lawyers to argue uh, their appeals in, in the Ninth Circuit. And uh, we do it through law school clinics, we do it through major law firms, uh, we encourage anybody who wants to do it to apply. And it's really an important part of what being a lawyer is all about. Yeah? I think it's both. Uh, I, I think the, the, the categories or the boxes, take the word enemy combatant or prisoner of war, is essentially a legal term of art that comes out of the underlying documents. A prisoner of war is defined in the Geneva Conventions. And um, once you are designated as a prisoner of war, then you are entitled to the protections of the Geneva Convention. Um, enemy combatant means something under the Military Commissions Act. And, whether or not you're a United States citizen or an alien makes a difference. But then on top of all that, I think it's accurate to say that the courts are asked in, in weighing these constitutional questions to, to consider the legitimacy of the government's claim of national security versus the risk to violating fundamental constitutional principles. And that's a very, the a reason I, I, I said delicate, it really is a delicate balancing act that, that courts have to engage in. One, okay, we have one more question and then it's time for reception. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I, I guess the only, the only reaction I can give you to that is, think about what would have happened in World War II if World War II had gone on for 15 years and people had been held as prisoner of war in, uh, in, in uh, POW camps. Um, you know, I think under the Geneva Convention, the, the uh, combatants probably could have been held for that period of time. Even though they, other than determining that they were prisoners of war, there wouldn't necessarily be charges brought against them, but they would be held because you don't want them going back to the battlefield and rejoining the fight. And we were just lucky that World War II didn't last any longer than it did, because when the war was over, basically everybody except for the high-ranking officials uh, went home. Well, thank you all. It's been a real honor to, to be here. <laughs> I really appreciate you doing it. Thank you.